So here today, we will be addressing questions such as this one. Why is the Ecumenical Patriarchate relevant today? What, what is its purpose? What are the functions it performs? So we can revisit much of that information many of us have received time and again in the past, but it bears a repeating. It's worthwhile because we'll give it a context that I hope is more powerful and understandable today. In addition, we'll discuss what are the unique privileges that the ecumenical patriarchy have and from where do they emanate. And other patriarchs and autocephalous churches do not have such privileges. What are they? Why are they? We'll talk about what is the administrative structure and the governance of the patriarchate. How is it organized? How does it perform its functions? Another topic we'll touch on is why is the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North America under the jurisdiction of the Ecumenical Patriarchate? Why is it so? How did it happen? And also, why does the Ecumenical Patriarchate remain in Turkey? Why do they move on? Go to Greece, come to America, whatever. And so the agenda we will follow is made up of these eight elements here. We'll start at the beginning describing what in Greek we call the presvia, the primacy, the leadership, the eldership of the patriarch himself. What is that? How do we view this? How do we interpret it? We we'll then go into a short description of world orthodoxy, and we'll describe how the various churches in the orthodox domain are structured. Father will come and talk about the seven ecumenical councils, very briefly focusing on the power they bestow on the ecumenical patriarchate and from which will it will flow the patriarchal authority, traditions, the canons and prerogatives, the, which will lead us to talk about the mission at the Ecumenical, Ecumenical Patriots, Kate, and the imperative for its preservation. And finally, we'll discuss a little bit about how the, the patriarch is elected and how the uh, Holy Synod is governed, and we'll have some closing reflections, okay? So after we're done with this, we would have answered the questions I posed in the slide before, I hope. As we dig into all that detail that I described earlier, let us not forget that the main, the, 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 the highest, more um, holy mission that we have and the patriarch has is the unity of Orthodox Christianity. And it always goes to that particular ultimate mission that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. John 17 through 21. So that's the ultimate purpose of this conversation. So we go into the eldership question, the presvia, and we actually start with a contrast. The contrast is the papacy, the Pope of Rome. In contrast, his eldership, his presvia with ours. We tend to understand, we hear a lot about the Catholic Church and how it's managed and what the structure is. So we'll contrast to that. And we are a very, we have a very different understanding than the Catholics do. Our understanding is primacy is a primacy of honor, not a primacy of administration, dogma, monarchial power, authority, or infallibility. None of that. We have a primacy of honor in a structure of the Orthodox Church. 
And that is what informs our understanding of his presvia. He is the first among equals. That's how we describe his status and his authority. Equal of among the autocephalous Orthodox churches, but Constantinople is the leading voice on matters of faith, doctrine, but does not reign supreme over an earthly kingdom. So this raises this question as to how do the unique, do the unique rights and privileges that have accrued to the see of Constantinople, how do they come about, where do they emanate from? And that's what we'll get into slowly. But first, let's talk about the world orthodoxy. Who are these 300 million Orthodox in the world today? And we start at 451 AD. This is the Fourth Council, Ecumenical Council in Chalcedon. And at that time, the very, the first uh, major, I'd say major, uh, split has occurred in the Orthodox Church. The Trinitarians and the Monophysites went in different ways. And over the first 1,000 years of Christianity, the Trinitarians have all been as a one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Its administrative center was Constantinople, and there were four other patriarchates of Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, a total of five. These are the five original churches. And during this period of time, all the canons, the structure, the governance of our church was formed as defined by the seven ecumenical councils convened after the uh, Edict of Milan in uh, 313 AD, whereby Constantine the Great had accepted Christianity as a legitimate religion of the Roman Empire. And so all the Trinitarians agree, adopt, abide by these seven ecumenical councils. And then comes 1054, the second most significant rupture in the Christian uh, in the Trinitarian Church, and that is at 1054, as I said, between the East and West, the Roman uh, Latins, uh, Latin, uh, Roman Catholic, and the uh, Greek-speaking uh, Roman Orthodox. And that remains so uh, for a thousand years until 1965, as you know the story, Athenagoras, Patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI, um, they lifted the mutual anathemas, and then a dialogue of love began, which continues still today. Right. So today, in the Orthodox world, we have two Eucharistic communities, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Oriental Orthodox Churches. And roughly, they're split 225 million Eastern Orthodox, 75 million Oriental Orthodox. And the Eastern Orthodox Church is made up of various autocephalous churches, which have individually distinct administrative and local culture, but in terms of the relationship with one another, they are in full communion. <coughs> And they also hold the same beliefs, generally follow the same rites. Now this is not the same with the Oriental uh, Orthodox churches, which also has a number of autocephalous churches. And they too have their own uh, beliefs and are united in uh, communion. However, their uh, practices are uh, significantly different. They have different rites, different, somewhat different uh, dogmatic 
uh, uh, dogmatic differences. So then again, we, lo we look at the top five most populous count Orthodox countries in the world. The first one is Russia, and I'll show you a couple of charts coming up soon. Then Ethiopia, Ukraine, Romania, and Greece, and these five account for 210 million of the 225 million. And so, and then we have 15 other Orthodox countries in the world in which the population of Orthodox is over 1 million in each. The United States is number 10, and we have just under 5 million Orthodox here in the United States. And then there's the separate classification of which are the countries that have the most Orthodox in terms of their population. The largest one is Armenia, which is almost 100% Orthodox. Uh, Moldova, Georgia, Greece, and Romania, and all they have 85% or more Orthodox population. So that's generally uh, uh, the summary of it. Here are all the countries. On the left, we start with Russia, 100 million. Ethiopia, which is an Oriental church, right? It has about 45 million people. Number three is Ukraine. You can now understand how this population, Orthodox population, got into was a major con uh, consideration in granting autocephaly, the third largest Orthodox country. Then we have <clears throat> Romania, Greece, Egypt, all the way down to India, Armenia, um, Eritrea, Syria, and so forth, with a population of a million or more. So that's how the, popul the Orthodox population is spread around the world. Now this one is the percent of population of the country that is Orthodox. And we have, the first one is Armenia, uh, almost 99%, 98. Then comes Moldova, Greece, Georgia, and so forth. Until we come to somewhere in the middle, there is uh, Belarus, I think, which is just under 50% uh, are uh, uh, Orthodox, and, and goes down from there. You know, if, you can't, if you have a country that you wish to highlight, you can do so, but I find it interesting. Even Jordan, 5% uh, of the population of Jordan is Orthodox. All right, continuing on the survey, uh, like I said before, the 225 million are governed by, comprised, I should say, by uh, within 15 autocephalous churches. And this is an important point. Only one of these churches supersede ethnos, supersedes ethnocentrism, and that is the Holy Mother Church of Constantinople. That means all the others, the 14 of them, are either all or mostly ethnic Orthodox churches, like Serbia, Romania, uh, the, the, the part of the ethnic community, if you will. The Church of Constantinople is one that is not. And so, here in America, when we talk about the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, which of course operates under the jurisdiction, it's the house of worship, not just of Greece, not just of Greeks from Greece, but also from the former Ottoman Empire uh, 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 countries in the Balkans. Uh, I mentioned Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Middle East, and so forth. And of course, included is all the local, the American people who have embraced orthodoxy 
and everyone who is chrismated, baptized, or otherwise received in the church. So this is a multinational, multi-ethnic church. We call ourselves Greek Orthodox, not because we are ethnically Greek, although, of course, many of us are, but because we respect and honor the Hellenistic culture that prevailed since the use of the Greek language in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. And that was done 150 years before Jesus Christ. The Old Testament was translated into Greek, and it was read in Greek in synagogues, the temple, and so forth. And then the New Testament, all the scriptures originally were written in Greek, which was the lingua franca at the time, and that is why we call Greek Orthodox Church. So I, I, I submit to you one more time that the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North America is part of the Mother Church of Constantinople and not the Orthodox Church of Greece. All right, we continue on the survey. Now we're settling into, we're going to talk about autocephaly. And for that, I need to introduce you to Canon 28 of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, which we referenced before in 451 AD. And it reads, the Bishop of New Rome, which is Constantinople, shall enjoy the same privileges as the Bishop of Old Rome, which is the Pope, on account of the removal of the empire from Old Rome, meaning Old Rome is no longer the seat of the empire. It is now Constantinople. And because of that, the privilege from Old Rome have flown or have transplanted, were transplanted uh, also to the seat of the Sea of Constantinople. And it says, it goes on, for this reason, the bishops of Pontus, and Pontus is the, uh, the, the, the lands all around Black, the Black Sea, Efxinos Pontus, right? All those bishops around there, all the bishops of Thrace. Now Thrace, today, begins sort of just east of Thessaloniki. It goes all the way to Constantinople, and then north, Thrace is Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova, and parts of Ukraine. That is the ancient Thrace. Oh, sorry, I missed the punchline here. As well as the barbarian bishops shall be ordained by the Bishop of Constantinople. Now that word ought to grab you somehow and wonder what does that mean? What's barbarian? Well, in the old days, barbarian lands referred everything which is outside the Roman Empire. That's basically what they refer to. It's the Germanic tribes, the Gauls, the Goths, the you know, up north, the, the Slavs, the Kazakhs, and so forth. So these are uh, all the lands, and over time it came to mean, like the, the explanation says, came to mean the jurisdiction over the entire world, except those jurisdictions that are governed by autos, their own autocephalous churches. All other regions, are under the Sea of Constantinople. It's a very important Canon 28. And of course, you can infer that the Church of Moscow does not believe that. They have a different interpretation. We'll get into that. So the first church to be granted autocephaly by the Ecumenical Patriarchate was the Metropolis of Moscow in 1589. 
And the reason for that was that by that time, it's 100 years after the, the, the uh, Ottoman Empire essentially took Constantinople, and now they had all the territories from the Balkans that I described before, and they went all the way to, to Vienna, then east to Mesopotamia, Caucasus, northern Black Sea, Crimea, when we go to Egypt, all those lands were the Ottoman Empire. And all the <coughs> Orthodox lived, except for the Russians, they lived within the Ottoman Empire. So the Sultan, uh, reaff well, the ecumenical patriarch, had the authority, and that authority was granted to him by the Sultan and his fellow Orthodox churches, that the Patriarch of Constantinople had jurisdiction over all these Orthodox flock that lived under the bound, in the boundaries of the Ottoman Empire. The Russians then don't, don't like that because that is a major um, political adversary. They had fought many wars with the Turks, the Ottomans. And so it stands to reason uh, that the Russian Tsars and the Patriarch of Moscow at the time, Metropolitan of Moscow, had the, the yearning to legitimize the ecclesiastical independence from Constantinople, and they sought autocephaly from Constantinople and received it in 1589, like I said before, and Pope, uh, Patriarch Jeremiah II actually granted autocephaly to the, the Moscow uh, Metropolitan and uh, conferred the Patriarchate to him. So that's how that became, that was the first event. And so then come the 19th and 20th centuries with a lot of nationalism and independence movements and the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and all these territories where the Orthodox populations started breaking away and the Ottoman Empire started shrinking and they too wanted their own autocephalous church. And so in about 150 years since uh, during this period of time of, of uh, independence movements, the Ecumenical Patriarch granted autocephaly to nine different churches. And I'll have a list coming up in a few minutes. And nine plus the original five, that's the 14. And just this fall, we got the 15th, which is Ukraine. And so there are today 15 autocephalous churches. Uh, they're all, as I said before, distinct in administration, local culture, but united in confession and very similar in liturgical practices. And even Russia has broken communion. It's not because of dogma. It's because of political considerations. So the significance of, uh, of autocephaly is that A, it assures self-governance for each church in terms of the internal uh, uh, issues and governance, but in terms of their external relations and with other Orthodox churches, sister churches, none of them can act alone. All with the, within the canonical traditions of the Orthodox Church and His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Constantinople, is the convener and, this, and he sets the agenda for all these concilia meet, meetings. And I'll talk quite a bit about that in what's coming up down the road here today. Here's the list of the 14, and then Ukraine is excluded because and this, this is the list of autocephalous churches uh, accepted by everybody, but since Ukraine is not yet accepted by everyone, like uh, Russia, then I didn't list them as number 15. But of course, we uh, will consider that uh, to be part of that as we go forward. Okay, so that's, that's the list. 
And now I call on Father to take us a little bit more deeper into the question of the ecumenical councils. Father, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harry. Okay, you press this one here. Okay. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. We'll be just making a short review of the seven ecumenical councils, just have some sense of what it is that applies from those councils to our, um, our modern situation. And we'll just start by speaking a little bit about the genesis of the ecumenical councils. It helps to be reminded that as Christianity spread across the Mediterranean, uh, bishops um, were ordained as pastors to evangelize and oversee each new local community and to lead, instruct, resolve differences and inspire the faithful in life and in worship. In fact, it's the meaning of the word bishop is coming from the Greek episkopi. Literally, it means an overseer, someone who's gonna make sure everything is happening in the right orderly way. Each bishop had complete autonomy in, in governing his respective area as long as he maintained the orthodox confession by proclaiming one faith, one Lord, one baptism, in unity with his fellow hierarchs. As differences in doctrine and practice inevitably emerged, then local councils of bishops were convened uh, to resolve them in a peaceful manner. An ecumenical or universal council is an assembly of hierarchs representing faithful Orthodox Christians throughout the world to discuss and resolve differences um, regarding church dogma, doctrine, administration, and on canonical practice, and whose decisions are affirmed by the church at large, both by the clergy and the laity, and thus they become binding on all. An ecumenical council, uh, they are convened so as to maintain the oneness of the Christian faith, thereby setting a, a protecting hedge as it says in Psalm 139.5, around the boundaries of orthodox, of right worship, right believing theology and Christology, what we believe about the nature of Jesus Christ and of the dogma, uh, those required um, matters of faith for all Christians. All of the ecumenical councils were convened by the emperor of the Roman Empire, um, who at that time was in Constantinople. The Orthodox Christian, Roman Catholic, and Oriental churches that we spoke of um, um, just a few minutes ago all trace their origins to the period of these ecumenical councils and to an even earlier time known as the Age of the Apostolic Fathers. We have many writings of the Church Fathers. And um, so first to the Holy Apostles and then to the Church Fathers such as Basil and Chrysostom and Gregory. Only the Orthodox and Roman Catholics accept all of the first seven ecumenical councils as legitimate. The, the Oriental, the non-Chalcedonian churches accept only the first three. Orthodox Christians also recognize two more councils as ecumenical, the eighth and the ninth ecumenical councils of Constantinople. The convening of these councils by the Patriarch of Constantinople further underscores the authority that he has as the ecumenical patriarch uh, to convene councils. This map just shows uh, the, the concentration of those councils. As you can see, um, three councils convened in Constantinople, uh, one in uh, Chalcedon, two in Nicaea, and one in Ephesus. Um, uh, the eighth council was in 880 AD, um, and the 9th in 1341. And um, these were also both convened in the city of Constantinople. Now let's go to some of the um, traditions, canons, and, and the prerogatives of the patriarch. Uh, from, where do, uh, from where does his authority emanate? <clears throat> uh, let's speak first of all uh, on his title. His title is his Most Divine All Holiness, the Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch. When we say divine, we mean in the sense of being sanctified, a person uh, who by grace 
um, not by nature has been sanctified. We don't say that he is divine in that he is God, but he is, uh, is a holy person. Uh, he ranks as the primus inter pares, or first among equals, among the heads of the autocephalous Orthodox churches that comprise world orthodoxy. The term ecumenical is a historical reference to the ecumeni, a Roman designation for the civilized world. The Roman Empire stemming from Canon 28 of the Council of Chalcedon that has come to mean in modern use universal because as Dr. Harry had mentioned, it's a reference to the barbarian lands, all those regions that were outside of the Roman Empire. And uh, that uh, would naturally comprise the rest of the world. Uh, um, he's widely regarded as the representative and the spiritual leader of the world's 300 million Orthodox Christians. Although we do have a dispute now that has unfolded, it, it really isn't about his being first among equals, but more so on how he exercises his office. Orthodox Christians on all continents who do not fall under the jurisdiction of the autocephalous or autonomous churches fall under the direct jurisdiction of the ecumenical patriarchate. This is from one of, the, uh, from one of the recent archon pieces of literature, but it has been widely understood. In history and in, uh, uh, in tradition, uh, by the canons, the ecumenical patriarchate has been granted certain prerogatives which other autocephalous Orthodox churches do not have. What are they? Equal prerogatives to old Rome. Uh, we spoke about the Fourth Ecumenical Council. Uh, uh, that um, uh, quality or that type of authority uh, was first stated in Canon 3 of the Second Ecumenical Council and then stated even more emphatically in, in clearly in Canon 28 of the Fourth Ecumenical Council. And then it was explained further in Canon 36 of the Fifth Sixth Council, which is known as the Quinisex Council. He also has the right to hear appeals, when invited, regarding disputes between clergy. That could be between priests, between bishops, uh, between other hierarchs, and even between patriarchs. And Canons 9 and 17 of the Fourth Ecumenical Council state this very clearly. He also has the right to ordain bishops for, for areas outside defined canonical boundaries. And once again, Canon 28. He has the right to establish Stavropedial monasteries, in other words, monasteries that are not accountable to their local hierarch, but they are accountable to Constantinople. Um, and um, certainly one of the more famous of these type of monasteries uh, is the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, England, which was the home of Father Sophroni. Um, so even in the territories of other patriarchates, he has the ability to do this. And thus we see even in the Ukraine, there are certain churches that have been deeded and certain monasteries that have been deeded, so to speak, um, to the authority of the patriarchate. Um, uh, this next section has to do with the election of, of the ecumenical patriarchs. And I think I'm going to invite Dr. Harry to come back up to speak on this section. Yes. Thank you, Harry. Right. Okay. So, how does the patriarch get elected? It's very different than in the, than the Catholic Church and the Pope that we hear from time to time. So, what happens is first there's a master list that is prepared by the Holy Synod, and is uh, and is sent to the Turkish authorities for vetting. That's required by the Turkish law, that, that they have to vet every patriarch before he accepts uh, to run, if you will, every person before he accepts to run for the office of the patriarch. And so that uh, vetted list comes back to the patriarchate, and again, the 12 members of the Holy Synod uh, propose three names to go uh, uh, from the uh, vetted list to, 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 be, to be considered as candidates 
for the office of the patriarch. So three names. And now there's an open ceremony uh, in which, uh, which is at St. George uh, pa uh, Patriarchal Church in Fanar, and each member inscribes the name of his choice on a piece of paper on the altar and then casts his ballot in a receptacle before the patriarchal throne, okay? And then two proclaimers draw the ballots and read aloud the names which are inscribed. And the one with the majority vote is elected patriarch. So, as I mentioned, the Turks had the authority to interfere with this particular procedure, which of course is a source of a great concern to all of us and to the archons. And, and how do they do that? Well, as I said, the actually I didn't say that yet, I'm saying it for the first time, but <laughs> requiring the candidates to be Turkish citizens by birth. All right, they have to be Turkish citizens by birth. Well, it's a little tough now that, you know, there were a couple hundred thousand people living in, in, uh, in Istanbul, and back in the old days, there were, you know, millions of them in Anatolia, Zmir, and so forth. Uh, and now, there's 5,000, 3,000 people. So therefore, that becomes a little difficult. B, they require vetting of the candidates prior to submission, and I described how that's done. And C, they always have the threat to say, I will appoint a person if I don't like the one you picked. Okay? So now let's go back a little bit, back 1948. Well, we all know our beloved Athenagoras, was, who was the archbishop here in America, he was sent to, uh, to Constantinople to become the patriarch. Well, he was born in Greece. He was a Greek citizen. How was that possible that he was accepted? Well, what happened is, by political pressure, uh, President Harry Truman in 1948 had power at that time to dictate to the Turkish government, and when Athena Horas landed at the airport, he was handed his passport. Now he was a Turkish citizen. Right? That's how it happened. And by the way, he traveled on Air Force One, just a little historical interest uh, event. But here's the good news. Since he became patriarch, Bartholomew was able to secure approval of the Turkish authorities to grant citizenship by naturalization to all the clergy who apply for priestly vocation or synodal tenure at the Fanar. Now that's amazing. I don't know if a lot of people are aware of that. All right, so now there are bishops from throughout the world as you know, various countries, including I think the Metropolitan of Korea is a Turkish citizen, for example, <laughs> right? And they, they have acquired uh, Turkish citizenship. So these people, these Metropolitans, are eligible to be uh, put in the first uh, list of, to be vetted by the Turkish government. So once, well, that's the next step. Okay, so that's all good news and that's one of the major accomplishments of the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew for which we're all very thankful. So as a result, it's been speculated that, you know, in the past that, well, <laughs> he's got to be the last patriarch of Constantinople uh, be because he's going to have to move somewhere else so that the succession can continue. And to that I say, un highly unlikely. And furthermore, Archdeacon John Chrysavies, who wrote his biography, states in his book, 
and I recommend that highly if you're interested in, in the uh, um, biography of, of this holy man. The Ecumenical Patriarch stands on the tall shoulders of untold forebears of a long apostolic succession, 269 so far. He's the 270th Ecumenical Patriarch. As successors to the historical throne of, in Constantinople, how can he even consider moving his historical institution? How is that possible? It has been there for 17 centuries, and Hagia Sophia and Hagia Irini, these are the two most famous, uh, among others, edif you know, churches in, in, uh, in Turkey, they were here 1,000 years before the present of any mosque. All right, and so to those who think that the Patriarchate will move from Turkey, I say, don't rush. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen anytime soon. And so I, uh, we say also that he is not the last Orthodox Patriarch in Turkey. In fact, he has ensured through this, uh, Th this thing I mentioned and other things we'll talk about, he, he's ensured the ongoing longevity of the Co Church of Constantinople, i.e. the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16, so that the patriarchal throne will continue from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 103. And so with that, I turn it back to Father for the thing. Is that right, Father? Sure, why not? Okay, good. Thank you. The mission of the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the imperative for its preservation. There are really 12 dimensions of his leadership, and sometimes we only think very narrowly of a few of them, but it helps to uh, just review them together. Apart from his duties as the Archbishop of Constantinople, um, he is the first among equals in a conciliar Orthodox Church. He is the promoter of unity of the Orthodox Church. He's the convener in chief and the setter of agendas for the Orthodox Synaxis. And he has a long history of those, those kind of convocations. He's the grantor of autocephaly. Every church that is autocephalous, that is recognized by all the other churches that are autocephalous, receive their autocephaly from the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Those first four items we'll be speaking about in this uh, presentation, but there are other things that um, we should also be aware of. He's the champion of Orthodox faith and dogma. He would never hesitate to raise his voice. He's the moral leader on, on matters of social justice. He is the archpriest of creation and has taken the title uh, the Green Patriarch. And he has made, um, I think it's five trips around the world and various river trips uh, to make sure that the waterways of the world remain uh, clean and to highlight those issues and challenges. He is the bridge builder to other faiths. The Patriarchate of Constantinople uh, is the founder and the initiator, you might say, um, of uh, this dialogue of love to work towards unity with the other non-Orthodox professing Christian uh, faiths. He is the arbiter of final resort, as we saw from the Holy Canons, when requested to intervene. And he also is the canonizer of holy men and women. This is not an exclusive right, but the church is continually you're recognizing saints. He's the consecrator of Holy Chrism. Every, every church in Greek Orthodox America, when a, when a child is baptized or anyone is baptized, they will be anointed with the Holy Chrism that has been blessed in Constantinople as the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's also the repositor of Orthodox history and archives. Uh, in the sense, if someone is struggling to understand the history of the church, um, they serve as an act of reliable reference. 
The Holy See of Constantinople, in fact, incarnates the timeless and authentic ecclesiastical ethos, the spirit, and, and thronima, the mindset, the canons and traditions of orthodoxy. The see represents, coordinates, and convenes the synergy of the Orthodox Church worldwide and protects and preserves the principle of church's unity. For without her compass, orthodoxy could very quickly ultimately break up into 15 or more ethnic churches wandering aimless and, irres and irresolute. The leadership of, of the ecumenical patriarchate is manifested in a, a variety of ways, manifested in a, a variety of ways. The office holds up before the world, orthodox and non-orthodox, the central vision of the Christian faith, which is basic in the scriptures, preaching that Jesus Christ and him crucified, as it says in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, which is one reason why his all holiness would never shy away of his role as a leader in spite of living in a persecuted land. This vision is rooted in the life of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, and regarding the coherence of all things, material and spiritual, in the eternal beauty of the Holy Trinity that we call the unwaning light. The office speaks for an Orthodox Christian identity in precisely the way that Orthodox theology and sacred tradition, our writings, our hymnology, our icons, uh, all of these sacred traditions, in the same way they communicate, he is able to communicate by manifesting the life and the energy of the Holy Spirit as a testament to the truth rather than arguing for it or enforcing it. He has no earthly power, so to speak. The energy that is associated with the office does not depend on the power to compel and control. It has no legislative nor enforcing powers. Unlike in the Christian West, canon law was never punitive uh, in the legal sense. The office acts as a reminder that the purposes of God and his church do not depend on numbers on material resources or wealth or cultural hegemony or whatever, these come and go. But the essential identity remains liturgical, spiritual, and, and we could add dogmatic, in the service of the world and in the unity of orthodoxy. It is precisely the frailty, it is precisely the frailty of his All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew's maiden church, deprived of national protection and unable to make threats in pursuit of territorial claims that makes him, by history and by destiny, the appropriate center for unity in the Orthodox world. And just to say by way of contrast, it's a well-known fact that the Church of Russia has a lot of oil money behind it in other mineral resources. But His All Holiness lives in a very poor environment. Now we're going to invite Dr. Harry to come back and speak a little bit about the various assemblies overseen by His All Holiness, which are very, very active in the world today. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Okay, so we, uh, we are going to go into the topic of governance here and, and, and how he exercises authority, if you will, or prerogatives that he has. And uh, I will start with a question that's so important, and that is orthodox unity. Okay? And so the first thing I will remind uh, uh, all of us is that he was elected <clears throat> 28 years ago in November 1991, okay? And four months after his election, he convened the very first synaxis of primates, which means 
the assembly of the heads of all 14 autocephalous churches met in Constantinople. For the first time, and I was trying to think about in how many years, I think I came out with centuries. Because just before this time, there was a Soviet Union and all the Orthodox churches under its domain. So there was no Orthodox synaxis of all the autocephalous people. Before that, it was the Ottoman Empire. Before that, it was the period in which the Russians had abolished the Patriarchate in 1721, I think. Uh, Emperor Peter the Great said, there is, there is not gonna be any more patriarch. And he put his own person to run the Russian Patriarchate. So for, for 200 years until 1917, there was no Russian Patriarch. So the ability to, hold every, to bring everybody together, this has occurred for the first time in March 1992 in Constantinople. Very significant event. And the purpose of that is, of course, to begin the dialogue of conciliation, understanding among all Orthodox churches. He was the leader in making that happen. And since then, he did these four or five other events, all with the Orthodox, in the presence of the Orthodox primates. <clears throat> in Patmos, Jerusalem, Constantinople again, again in Constantinople in 2008, and the very last one in uh, Chambesi in Geneva in January 2016, six months before the, the holy and great, or the great and holy, I forget which one, <laughs> which way it goes, uh, uh, the Council of Crete, okay? So all these things, uh, inaugurated, that he inaugurated, inspired greater orthodox cooperation, facilitated and finalized substantial work of the previous pan-orthodox consultations and commissions, not necessarily among heads of autocephalous churches, but among bishops, metropolitans, representatives, priests who participated in conversations and I'll present you with a list of all these that had happened since the 1960s. And ultimately, <clears throat> it led to the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church in Kolimvari in Crete. So this is the culmination of the product of Patriarch Bartholomew. Uh, here are the pan-Orthodox and pre-conciliar conversations that I alluded to with representatives of the ver all the various Orthodox churches around the world. That was in 1961 under Athena Horas, another one 63, the f uh, 64, all of them in Rhodes, then 68 in Champs-Élysées again, and then again uh, all the preconciliar uh, uh, up to 2015 in Champs-Élysées. Uh, so there's been a lot of conversation about this. Here's the picture from the very last one, uh, the, the very le recent one, I should say, in January 2016 in uh, Chambesi. You can see them, uh, the, the hierarchs are uh, here in uh, some kind of a ceremony. I'm not sure I can identify any one of them except uh, Kirill of Moscow, who is sitting, I think, to the right of the patriarch Bartholomew, uh, not the immediate right, the next one. I think that's uh, Kirill. All right, and so this is the synaxis I referred to before the, the council in Crete, and this is uh, the <coughs> primates in a work, working session Again, same meeting in January 2016 in, uh, in Geneva. And after that, we have the Holy and Great Council of Crete. And this was a downer, a disappointment. Why? Uh, in many respects, because in the very last minute, 
literally hours before everybody in January and another conversation they had in March and so forth, they agreed that they will come there. In fact, Kirill had asked that this, uh, the original site for the meeting change from Constantinople, which was the original plan, to Crete, because at the time, if you remember, uh, Russian planes were downed in, by Turkish fire over, over Syria, and, and a couple of planes, I think, crashed. And so it was time, the tension, time of tension between Turkey and Russia, and so just for security, Kirill asked that the meeting change and it was moved to Crete. Well, they didn't show up. And because of Moscow, uh, Bulgaria and Georgia didn't show up for essentially, in short, political reasons. And Antioch, because they have a, a grief with the patriarch on some other issues, which minor, I might say, nevertheless, they didn't come either. And so 10 of the 14 showed up after extensive planning, like I said, from 1960 to 2016, 46 years of planning. And almost on the day of the meeting, they got the, 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 the news that Kirill was not coming, Patriarch Kirill was not coming. Well, they accomplished uh, uh, the affirmations are the results of, uh, of the, the topics that were discussed. I don't know, Father, if you wish to say anything about those, uh, you can read them. And uh, it was a real disappointment to all of us. And uh, let me go on then. I'll move from this subject to another major accomplishment, I think which has to do with the Pan-Orthodox Episcopal Assemblies. This was now June 2009. Uh, again, at one of those meetings I referenced in the slide before, a momentous decision was unanimously taken, unanimously by all the uh, churches, autocephalous churches, the primates themselves, the primates and that is to create assemblies of bishops in, country, in countries where there is overlapping jurisdictions. So that in every country, and I'll show you the list, there's only one bishop. Whether it's a, a, a bishop of a Greek Orthodox or Serbian Orthodox or whatever. So these duplicate, duplicate bishoprics in, in the orthodox sense, be eliminated. They swore, and in fact, they wrote it in their rules of operation, of, uh, that then their unswerving obligation to safeguard the unity of the orthodox church and to advance the, sweet, the swift healing of the canonical anomalies, especially the problem of parallel presence of multiple bishops in one and the same city or diocese, right? And they selected these geographies in which uh, the bishops of all the autocephalous churches present there would meet and solve the problem of duplication. In fact, the first one, the United States of America, the Assembly of Canonical Bishops, uh, was charged as far as I know, uh, to present their uh, uh, model of how they're going to do that at the Crete, the Holy Great Council in Crete. That never happened. They never got that far, unfortunately. So we, had to, we have such uh, assemblies of bishops that gather and talk, not only in the United States, but in Canada, Latin America, all these countries, and none of them so far from 2009 were able to, pre to prepare a blueprint that will solve this particular problem, which they affirmed their unswerving obligation that they will do, right? Nevertheless, it's good to talk. 
we're going to get to there sometime. And, and that seed was planted at one of these assemblies uh, of, the, of the primates. And we recognize him, the patriarch, as the uh, person who has initiated that. Here's the, the one in the United States, the Assembly of Bishops in one of the last uh, meetings uh, at the center. Uh, by the way, all of these assemblies are under the uh, authority, the, 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 the person who calls the meetings is the Greek Orthodox primate in that uh, geography. They call the meeting. They organize and he, he leads the conversation. So Archbishop Demetrius is there at the center in this particular case. Now we move to another major um, accomplishment, I would say, which is he was the first ever patriarch to convene the synaxis of hierarchs of the ecumenical throne. Now what's that? <clears throat> well, those are about 100 bishops within his own immediate jurisdiction uh, of the ecumenical patriarchate. <clears throat> Every so often, uh, since 1992, as the third bullet says, uh, every so often, every two years or thereabouts, they meet uh, for two or three days in September in Constantinople, and they have a conversation about uh, all kinds of uh, subjects, including the most recent one, they discussed the question of autocephaly of uh, Ukraine. And uh, this meeting takes place in this church Holy Trinity, like I said, in Stavrodromian Constantinople. Here's one of the pictures you may have seen somewhere. And there they are uh, from the, 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 the last one, September 1 through 3, 2018. And then this is a picture in the working, uh, working inside the church, Hagia Triada. Uh, by the way, this is a church I grew up as an adult, and I was going there every Sunday. And uh, it's a church that my sister got married, various people were baptized and so forth, so that means a lot to me. And now I move on to the Holy Synod. The Holy Synod, as you know, is the administration decision-making body of the patriarch. The, uh, the synaxes of the hierarchs were, like I said, they're not the decision-making body, but uh, just a counseling body. Uh, this one is where decisions are made, and it has functioned since the early fourth century. Since the 300s, there was a holy synod in our church, okay? There are 12 people, 12 bishops, uh, either dwelling in Constantinople or visiting Constantinople, sorry for the typo there, and is the, the most powerful organ of the church in Byzantium. But in recent centuries, it, uh, the, uh, in recent centuries, and since, especially since 1923, consisted ex ex exclusively of bishops living in Fanar, by that I don't mean in the, in, the, in the Fanar per se, but in Istanbul, let's say. They were living there. But then another uh, initiative that was started by Bartholomew, which all of a sudden in 2004, in a bold move that was received with skepticism, as we say, uh, six of the 12 of the new members of the, that synod were from other metropol metropolises, not just Constantinople. And so for the first time, it expanded, and that happened in 2004. And then <clears throat> uh, what they do is they say for two years, for, for uh, one year term, but they rotate every six months, half of them. So by, what is it, by tomorrow, First of March, we'll have a list of who, the, who are the, who's the new, because they do it once in September, another one at the end of February, uh, the sixth rotation. 
So they meet monthly. Now, can you imagine, as I said, the Metropolitan from Korea, uh, and the Metropolitans here from the United States, they fly every month to Constantinople, right? To attend two or three or four day meetings. It's grueling, it's grueling. And now comes September 2013, now we have 11 of the 12 are from other than the metropolis of Constantinople. So essentially expanded the synod even more than ever before. So today we have the United States, Canada, Latin America, Great Britain, Australia, as well as from the Lekanisa, Crete, and so forth. So it's really a, you know, a multi, multi uh, facet, whatever the word is. And here's the latest one, December. You may recognize some of the faces from, especially from the United States. You can see the Metropolitan of New Jersey over there. Evangelos. Then I think I see a Methodius of Boston? No? Okay. So I won't guess anymore. <laughs> and now my, uh, my, my last piece before I call on Father, now we talk about administrative structure. And the reason for that, there's a lot of detail here, but it's not the, the details are not important, so that you can understand the reach of the task and the complexity of the task. Of this, of this small office, small patriarchate in Constantinople, which I'm sure all of you visited and have seen that this is not visiting the Vatican, right? It's not, you know, buzzing with people. It's just a handful of people trying to do all this work. And we start with the hierarchy of the throne. And like I said, <clears throat> maybe I didn't say that, uh, uh, there are about 150 bishops altogether uh, uh, under the hierarchy of the throne, and includes auxiliary bishops, retired people, and so forth. Uh, and there are about 150, and about 100 of these meet in the uh, uh, synaxis of the hierarchs of the of the ecumenical throne. So that's the population of metropolitans and bishops. Then there are synodal committees, or synodal committees, approximately 35 of them. Each one is managed by, or led, I should say, by a metropolitan, and has a small staff and various administrative functions, like here in our parish council, all kinds of committees, except there are 35 of them over there. Uh, there's the office of the Grand Chancellor, who manages the Patriarchate, uh, and archives and library and accounting and so forth. Then there is the Archdiocese of Constantinople itself, and there are 37 parishes in Constantinople remaining. Four high schools, 12 primary schools, 10 institutions of charity. There are the holy metropo metropolises in Turkey. There are five of those. <coughs> And there they are. And my favorite one is Princess Island, which is where I was born. Uh, the Holy Archdiocese of, North, of America, there are nine metropolises there. We know them all, right? There are other metropolises or entities under the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and there are 18 of those. Now, what are they? Well, we start with Australia, Great Britain, France, Germany, Austria, Scandinavia, Belgium, etc. They go to Buenos Aires, Mexico, Hong Kong, Portugal, Korea, like I said, Singapore, and so forth. So the, all these metropolises are und under the jurisdiction. There's the Holy Archdiocese of Crete. There are eight metropolises in Crete. If anybody is from Crete, they probably 
know them, know what they are, but they're right there. Then there's uh, the metropolises of Lonecanis, uh, the Lonecanisa, uh, five of them, and here they are in Rhodes, of course, the biggest one. Then the metropolis of the New Lands, there are 36 metropolises of the New Land. I want to highlight, spend a little bit of time, though. these 36 are about a third or 40 percent of all the metropolises in Greece, but they're not part of the Greek uh, ch ch Church of Greece. They are under the jurisdiction of the Ecumenical Patriarch and include Alexandrupolis, Igumenitsa, Drama, Thessaloniki, Mount Athos, of course, Ioannina, Castoria, you name it, Samos, Hios, and so forth. And then we have, <coughs> as Father mentioned, the Holy Patriarchal Stavropedic Monasteries. There are seven of those. He mentioned Essex. Essex is right there, St. John the Baptist. Of course, Patmos. Let's not forget Pat Patmos. That's under the jurisdiction of the Patriarch. Chalkidiki, Thessaloniki, Alabama. I didn't know we had a uh, monastery in Alabama, but here it is. And uh, St. Irene Chrysovalandu in Astoria. Is that correct, Spiro? Okay, very good. Uh, and there are other institutions abroad. There are seven of them various, in various places. I will not read them all uh, to you, but just locations are highlighted. And then five other organizations, such as delegation to the uh, World Council of Churches, the offices of the Great and Holy Church of Christ in, in uh, Athens, and liaison office for European community affairs, and et cetera, et cetera. So these are the, all these organizations. Now remember this, up, these are apart from being the Archbishop of Constantinople, which is sort of equivalent to Alexios. Right? And that's, now Alexios spends all the time traveling to all the parishes. Well, this man has to go to a whole lot more places <laughs> than that to cover and deliver his message to all. And I think that's, and he is 78 years old. And today is his birthday. Actually tomorrow, 29th. It's his birthday, so he's a leap year child. So he's a fourth of the age, the, the, the age of ours. We'll sing him happy birthday later. Happy birthday later. Today is his birthday. And then, oh, I forgot, Finland and Estonia. How can we forget that? Two autonomous churches. And he's been to, of course, he, he, go, he was in Korea in February. In the middle of February, he went to Korea for a week. Okay, so I go back to what Father said. Well, what is, this, what is the function? What does he do? And like I said, we, he, Father explained, he talked about the first four of them, and not any of this five through 12, and I'm sure there's more we haven't added, uh, and perhaps we'll write monographs for some of these so we can distribute the functions and analyze them for you, but that, as, that is the task of this holy and great man. And now for our summary, our reflections, I'll pass it on to Father. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to go right into the closing reflections, uh, which are um, uh, just to summarize, that His All Holiness does not lead through an authoritarian construct. How does He lead? It's a dialogue of love, whereby traditions and canons and precedents are respected under the primacy of the Holy See. Of course, that presents a challenge when people don't want to respect those traditions and those canons, as we're starting to see uh, that to happen in the world now. But that's how He leads. 
Constantinople is the leading voice on, on matters of faith and doctrine, but she does not reign supreme as over an earthly kingdom, nor do we say that the patriarch is infallible. The spiritual energy that is associated with the office, which is the action of the Holy Spirit, does not depend on the power to compel and control, but on the power of love. His All Holiness has been serving for 28 years, and, and his impressive and, and his consequential reforms indeed make him one of the greatest patriarchs of all time. The essential identity of his leadership remains liturgical, as we saw in that picture. Uh, he was manifesting that he is first among equals by where he was sitting uh, at uh, the center point, the focal point of all the other patriarchs. Um, it's also spiritual, and it is in the service of the world and for the unity of orthodoxy. And uh, by the way, the longest uh, um, tenure, um, uh, uh, he is the longest serving patriarch since Patriarch Sergius, who served from 610 to 638 AD. Uh, the, the longest ever serving was Titus, who served from 242 to 272 uh, for 30 years. And he's not too far from that mark. So he'll probably outlast even Titus. Finally, just to say by way of uh, closing that uh, once again to come back to the high priestly prayer of Jesus in his farewell discourse in the upper room. Uh, that the Lord was praying that all may be one and he's just as you father praying to his heavenly father are in me and I am in you may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me John 17 21 that concludes our presentation thank you so much everybody and good night